Can I welcome everyone to the 11th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether to take agenda item three and four in private, which is a review of the evidence heard today and also consideration of the work programme. And is everyone content that agenda items four and five are taken in private? Thank you. Can we also confirm that we are content to take future reviews of evidence on the attainment and achievement of school aged experiencing poverty inquiry in private? Thank you. The next item of business is an evidence session on the attainment and achievement of school aged children experiencing poverty inquiry. This is the first evidence session on the inquiry, and before I start, I'd like to put on record our thanks to everyone who has contributed written evidence. Some of the evidence is arresting, and it is really important that the voices of young people, parents, teachers, and community workers are heard in Parliament. And we'll be hearing more from these people in coming weeks. And can I welcome to this meeting John Dickey, Director of Child Poverty Action Group in Scotland, Kevin Loudon, Research Officer Robert Owen Centre for Educational Change, Danielle Mason, Head of Research Education Endowment Foundation, and Dr Jim McCormack, Associate Director of Scotland, Joseph Roundtree Foundation. I should, should say to the panel from the outset that if you'd like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks, and I'll call you to speak. And before in inviting questions from my colleagues, uh, I'd like to ask the panel um, for its thoughts on two things. We've had received lots of evidence from lots of people that this is one of the major factors in the attainment gap, the, the, the fact that children are coming to school hungry and they don't look like maybe sometimes they've had a good night's sleep before, or, uh, and a lot of that seems to uh, attain to poverty. Why do you think that we've had a, a, a rise in the amount of that that's coming that seems to be impacting on the, the school attainment levels? And I'll then come on to ask you a number of uh, questions around interventions that you may be able to put forward. Would uh, anybody like to answer? <coughs> Jim McCormick. Thank you. Uh, can you just, just to start um, on, the, on that point, I think when we come on to talk, as, as we made this morning, about um, progress and achievements that are being made um, by children in low-income households, uh, I think it's important to say that those achievements are really against the odds um, and against a very heavy headwind in the sense that we know that after 20 years of progress with child poverty is now rising again. We've now got enough data over a number of years to tell us that we've passed a turning point. And so um, I, I, I think in common with many others, um, one kind of framing point to bear in mind is um, there are things that can be done within the education system in how schools relate to uh, families, communities, the costs that they face. Um, but um, we have to be careful that we are trying to both improve the quality of what we do, the education, and attend to the income risks and shocks that families face, which show up, for example, in food poverty and food insecurity, um, and resist the temptation, as we've seen maybe in other parts of the UK, to say it's one or the other. Uh, both have to be in play if we're to make more progress over the next few years with the attainment challenge. Okay, thank you. Danielle? Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that, actually. When I was thinking about what evidence was going to be most useful to... No, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. No. When I was thinking about what evidence is going to be most useful to speak to you about this morning, I was thinking about this distinction between, on the one hand, reducing and alleviating the impacts of poverty for, for children on a day-to-day -day basis, and that can be you know, from the very large to the very small, the distinction between that and a specific focus on narrowing the attainment gap between poorer children and the rest. And you don't necessarily need the same types of interventions for those two different things. So, for instance, a really simple example, introducing swipe cards in schools for school meals so that there isn't the stigma between you know, free school meal children and other children. That can have a big impact on a child's experience of school, but it's not very likely to improve their attainment. I mean, at the margins, perhaps, but it's not going to be... It's unlikely to have a significant impact. So those two things are linked. The sort of alleviation of poverty and narrowing the gap, they're obviously closely linked. They're both extremely important. Um, but at EEF, where I'm from, we're quite narrowly focused on, on that narrowing of the gap. And in terms of that, 
it, it really is about improving the quality of teaching and learning in the classroom, even when you take into consideration these wider issues. So just to give some examples, we've some funded some projects which aim to raise attainment by alleviating the material impacts of poverty. So we funded some breakfast clubs and we've also funded a number of projects looking at raising attainment by engaging with parents. And, and in both cases, we have seen um, effective projects. But when you're looking specifically at narrowing the attainment gap, and, and I should stress again that I think both alleviating poverty and narrowing the attainment gap are equally important. But when we look at the attainment gap, it's about high quality teaching for children in disadvantaged areas, high quality early years provision, so we tackle that gap which we know opens really early, targeted evidence-based interventions in the classroom for children who are falling behind. Um, those are the things that are really going to impact on the attainment gap. I qualify that by saying this is assuming that poverty isn't actually preventing children from being in school in the first place. Uh, something else that might just be useful to say right at the beginning is that this can be done. So um, I don't have the figures for Scotland. We did some analysis on English data recently and we saw that 10% um, of schools in England, around 10% of schools, had an average attainment for their disadvantaged children that was higher than the average for all children across the country. And those aren't just a few really posh schools with a tiny number of poor kids. Some of those are schools in areas of high disadvantage with large numbers of disadvantaged children. So it can be done, and that should give us all cause for optimism, I think. OK, thank you. John? Yeah, um, very much echo uh, what Jim and Danielle have said in terms of that balance. If we're serious long-term in ending the poverty attainment gap, then we need to be tackling the underlying poverty that's driving that gap. Um, answer to your question, as Jim said, we are seeing increasing levels of, of child poverty in Scotland across the UK, um, and the projections are substantial increases in the, in, in, in the years ahead. Um, and not just increases in the kind of day-to-day, -day, uh, in the day-to-day -day grinding poverty, just not having enough money to live on, increasing number of families being left in acute income crisis as well as a result of um, primarily failures in our, our social security system and uh, sanctioning and uh, administrative problems in the system, leaving people with little or no money at all. Um, so that does translate, in the worst cases, to children ending up at school hungry. In, in some cases, children not actually getting to school at all because of uh, uh, the cost of even getting to, to school in the first place. Um, but more, um, uh, more widely, children missing out on significant aspects of the school day, school trips, school activities, the additional pressures that schools putting on families with already low incomes in terms of charging for um, curriculum course materials for, 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 for course activities, um, leaving children missing out, as I say, on, on school trips, a whole range of ways in which children are missing out on core parts of the, of, of the school day. So, Long term, we need to be tackling the underlying poverty, and that's why we welcome the Child Poverty Act here in Scotland that sets very clear targets towards eradicating child poverty by 2030, a delivery plan that sets out uh, meaningful action that will take us in that direction. Um, but at the same time, as others have said, there are, there are real actions uh, that can be taken within schools. And a good news story, lots of schools, lots of local authorities already um, taking forward action to, to reduce and remove the barriers to full participation at school that uh, too many children face in Scotland. Yeah, we'll be coming on to all those issues uh, over the course of this session, but uh, Kevin, do you like to come? Yeah, so just again reiterating and support everything that's been said, and it comes out quite thoroughly in the, the briefing document that was circulated, that schools really can make a difference. Uh, a lot of our research has shown that for that to happen, however, schools and teachers need a lot of support and the conditions have to be right. So whereas we might have key proven interventions or approaches that make a difference, pedagogical approaches that do help those from more disadvantaged areas, the skills of the teachers, the leadership in the school, the ethos in the school, the ability of the school to work in partnership with other agencies to enhance what happens in the school, to make it more holistic and engage with other agencies to have that value that value added impact uh, to take it beyond the classroom that needs particular attention uh, and focus okay the, a couple of members want to come in at this point you want? I mean, i'm interested in this point we'll probably deal with it in more detail later around so 
families are more impoverished, so it's an issue for them. The cost of school day is a real challenge, but is the cost of being at school rising as well? Anecdotally, we've heard that you know teachers are now bringing in materials that would routinely in the past have been um, provided by the local authority. Have you done any work around looking at things that children are now expected to pay for, which they may not have been expected to pay for in the past? Because I think there are two angles to come at this from, which is about what are we asking of families who are on a low income, but also are we asking more of them because schools themselves are under pressure? I wonder if there's any evidence in that. If, suppose our work has been over the last four or five years in terms of the in-depth work that CPAG has done in schools, so it's, we don't have that our own, in our own specific experience, that baseline. I think there's a sense that um, there are in increasing demands in terms of costs being passed on to families for uh, uh, you know, material costs of curricular material activities. Um, some of these issues have been there for a long time, mm -hmm. but the, the pressure on families has increased because mm -hmm. too many families now have uh, incomes that they're struggling to meet other costs with, but uh, others may have more evidence in terms of the long-term uh, uh, trends in terms of the, the, the actual cost of at school. We will be coming back to these issues later, so if I could just ask Richard to come in. You will want to say something, Richard. Well, I'm not sure if it's, it was just a general question to John Dickey, but what he said, uh, and also perhaps uh, Jim McCormick, you, you began to speak about factors outside of the classroom that can impact on poverty, and other speakers have spoken about factors inside the school that can deal with poverty. But my fear about the whole debate around educational attainment is we just talk about schools and teachers, whereas it's other factors that influence educational attainment, not just the school. Uh, can you just elaborate on where we are in 2018 with the factors out with the school that's impacting on children's ability to learn? Yes, I mean, uh, it, it, is, it, it is both, but there's no question that families are under increased, increased and increasing pressure that we've seen uh, primarily as a result to cuts in the benefits and tax credits and financial support available to family alongside stagnating wages low-income families have faced a real squeeze on their incomes and more and more families have been pushed below the poverty line and all the projections are that that will continue as, again, primarily as cuts to the financial support available to families um, kick in and, 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 and accumulate. Um, so there's no question that that puts real pressures on families, it makes it more difficult for families to ensure, that for parents to ensure that their children are able to fully participate uh, at, at school. I, mean, I, th I think it's worth saying that parents go to extraordinary lengths, and children themselves, maybe we'll come on to that later in terms of the resilience and the ingenuity of children and, and parents to be able to try and get the most out of the school day despite all those barriers that they're facing and the financial barriers they're facing. Um, but there's no question families under increased financial pressure um, cost is a mix. S school, getting to school, dressing for school, being able to fully participate at school, um, being able to uh, build on what happens in school in terms of the home environment and learning opportunities outside school, all of those have costs attached to them uh, in a situation where an um, increasing number of families are being pushed below the poverty line. Yes. And Jim McCormick. So we, we, we worked with a number of academics at the LSE and elsewhere over the, in, in recent years to try and look at international evidence on this and then bring it back to the UK and Scotland. And, and um, the important point here is to try and contextualise what is the role of these external forces, not least how poverty uh, acts as a pathway towards or against attainment. And it seems pretty clear when you, when you boil down lots of complex evidence that there are two main pathways. One is it just creates more stress in families. It creates anxiety, it damages mental health, particularly maternal mental health. Um, when you factor in if resources in terms of housing, security or quality are also limited, then it's a very hard environment, uh, especially for maybe older kids coming up to exams and so forth to stay on track with what they have to do with their learning. Um, um, and there's just less money to invest in, in um, you know, in, in equipment, in, in opportunities, in trips and so on, as John's saying. Um, so, so, 
achieving the kind of targets we've got in Scotland um, would be much easier against the backdrop of the recent past when child poverty is falling. That's a really important thing to see. Having said that, uh, we may come on to look at this, there are nonetheless very, very big variations in attainment, depending on which measure you take, um, controlling for area-based deprivation, which is to say that it really does depend where you go to school in Scotland as to how you're currently your fortunes look um, uh, in terms of attainment. So we should maybe talk a bit about that as well. But the big picture is absolutely that these external forces make it much, much tougher, uh, even with um, uh, things going in the right direction with the school system um, to achieve those good outcomes. Was um, Dr McCormick, can I just pick up on a very interesting uh, point that you've just raised there about the variability across Scotland. You said that the, the number and the characteristics of uh, deprived areas varies across local authorities, and this comparison suggests that attainment varies substantially within these deprived areas. But the reasons for this, you say, are not fully understood. Could I ask you, is that because there is an absence of the relevant data that we need to, yeah. to make that understanding, or is it just that we're not interpreting it correctly? So let me, let me try and talk a bit about the data, then my, my colleagues who are probably more expert in explaining what we know about the, the causal factors can maybe contribute as well. Um, so in Scotland, we, we have as our primary focus the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, an area-based measure. Um, which is helpful, but quite a blunt instrument, as the Parliament and this committee has talked about before. Because most families in poverty don't live in those areas. And even within them, most people are not in poverty. So it's a really broad um, uh, measure. But nonetheless, accepting that, that note of caution, um, we, we've taken one indicator from the improvement services, really useful local government benchmarking, um, framework and looked at um, at least five passes at NAT5, level five, which is a more demanding target than at least one pass, which is in one of the measures government uses. And that shows um, well over double the attainment in the best performing authorities compared to the least well performing authorities. Um, the best performing authorities are some of the usual suspects, and this is looking at children who live in deprived areas within them. But there's also quite an interesting mix of West of Scotland local authorities with very high rates of child poverty, which are doing relatively well in that measure. At the other end of the spectrum, performing less well, where your odds are less than one in three of attaining that level, um, is a mix of city and very rural authorities, which, which is very hard to see what they have in common. So that suggests to us, um, and it's not a very satisfying answer to your question. This is absolutely to do with how schools organise and collaborate. It's likely to do with how they relate with families and communities. It may be about resourcing, but it's maybe as much to do with how resources are deployed within those schools okay. as about absolute levels of resourcing. Um, and it will be to do with not just having good data, I think we're increasingly getting good data, but how data is used. So there's a know-how question within schools in spotting children who are off track. For example, in rural authorities, we may have schools with very small numbers of children on free school meals, who in the past at least could be almost invisible to those school systems. Now, we don't have that excuse of not knowing, and the challenge is, are we deploying that data well? Are we acting upon it? Are we targeting our resources well? And are we making sure children who really should be attaining higher are back on track? So, so Data, yes, but going beyond SIMD as a measure, uh, which I think is what the National Improvement Framework aspires to do. If I could just uh, really pick up from what Jim's saying, that's exactly what we've seen when we've worked with schools, not just researching and evaluating what they're doing, but helping teachers through research to, to do, do what they do better to uh, tackle inequality. And it is that ability to work to buck the trend almost, to deploy resources, uh, enhance teacher skills, work with partner organisations. And it's making sure that the conditions that foster that are known within the system, and when they are known, how those collaboratives of schools put them in place, embed them and sustain them. Because 
a lot of those factors that support what Jim's talking about to work that way, to, to try and offset some of the, the external poverty factors. Uh, you need to be quite uh, agile, shall we say, at the moment in the, in the current environment. And I think if schools, it, yes, some of it is resourcing, but teachers will often tell us uh, the lack of teacher cover, for example, really impacts on getting teachers together to plan collaboratively to improve their, their skills. So a lot of that building that infrastructure needs to be looked at. You know, what, what, what do we need to build that infrastructure to do what Jim's been talking about? It, it strikes me that the, that the data question is extremely important because we're, if we're going to formulate successful policy, we need to know exactly what the data uh, actually is telling us. Um, could you just be uh, more specific about the individual local authorities and whether you think they are using uh, the same data uh, across the board or whether different local authorities are using yeah. different data? It, would that be possible that's a yeah, problem? I think what we're finding, stimulated by the, the attainment challenge and then PEF, I think local authorities have revisited this and some, there's still variation in what data has been collected and how it's been used and fed back to teachers and so on. But I think we're seeing progress across Scotland generally in that local authority data teams and data officers are becoming more sophisticated in some of the factors we've talked about. You know, what are the variables that they need to gather data on, both in terms of attainment, but also the individual circumstances of the child and we were working with a local authority recently, and their data collection is now adding layers that looks at what interventions is the child receiving, what's the home environment like, and this is over time. So they'll, and this will become a very rich data stream. The, the skill then is, how is that used? How, do, how does that filter down to the classroom, to the teacher? Uh, but, but we have seen progress, but it is, it's, it's patchy. Mm -hmm. But again, authorities can learn from each other, and we have seen that where local authority officers are talking about their, their data uh, collection and usage as well. So just my, my final question would be, are, are all local authorities uh, looking to the likes of yourselves to help with this data collection, or are there some that are much more advanced in picking up better qualitative data? I think it varies for a whole range of reasons, you know, for, for their own resources and their own capacities. But I think as awareness gets out into the system about you know, what systems uh, help improve the use of data and then translate into effective approaches, I think that's another part of the strategy, making sure that that gets out into the system and ripples across. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gillian? Yeah, I'd like to pick up on a few things that people have said. I mean. Um, I can't remember who was it mentioned about getting the best teachers to the schools that need them the most in terms of... It. But that's obviously very difficult when you have a culture where if a school has a, a reputation of not achieving or it being difficult to work there and having, as I think it was uh, Jim McCormack said, a headwind of, of poverty, um, how can you bridge that kind of reputational thing of encouraging the best teachers to apply for jobs in those areas that have the most challenges when you've got, a, I suppose, a, a culture and maybe an inspections re regime that makes it look that these schools are failing? How can we make it attractive for teachers to actually look at these challenges and say, I want to work in that area, I want to make a difference to that area? So there is some evidence, not from the UK, but from the US, about um, financial incentives for teachers to move to schools in more disadvantaged areas, schools that are perceived as more challenging, which has, the evidence has shown an impact on actual children's attainment from those kind of schemes of incentive transfer. As I say, there's not much evidence from the UK on that yet, but at the EF we are starting to test interventions looking at teacher retention in disadvantaged schools, um, and that the evidence of that is going to come online in the next couple of years. Um, so, you know, there is there's, it, there are potential ways to kind of encourage good teachers that, to, to move to the most disadvantaged schools. There's also quite a lot of good quality evidence out there on the best type of 
continuous professional development for teachers. So it's not just about encouraging a specific group of teachers into a different set of schools, but to really build the skills and capacity of the teachers who are already there. So there's a good, um, there's a good base of evidence about the type of CPD that works of continuous professional development, you know, longer term interventions, things that are relevant to teachers' day-to-day -day expertise, that um, build a strong relationship between peers who are doing the training and the and the trainer. So there's kind of there's a there's a, an evidence base around the kind of CPD that works, and there's now increasingly an evidence base of the types of interventions that take that sort of training and deliver it to schools and then see an impact on pupils. So the kind of things that we've tested at the EEF would include um, metacognitive approaches to teaching. So this is where teachers understand Metacognition is sometimes um, referred to as learning to learn, but it's where teachers have a better understanding and are able to equip pupils with strategies to plan, monitor, and then evaluate their work so they're thinking about how they're learning. That has a good, good evidence base that when teachers have a good knowledge of how to do that, we see an impact on students. Um, high quality feedback, for, for example, teachers can be taught how to deliver high quality feedback, good questioning of pupils that builds cognitive skills, and again we see an impact on pupils. So there's both an evidence base around transferring teachers and then an evidence base around how to build high quality CPD. And if you can build that into reforms, um, then we can have more high quality teachers teaching on most disadvantaged pupils. And that quality of the pedagogy and the interaction between the teacher and the pupil is, as I said before, there's a much wider uh, issue here, but that's where you really get to the heart of improving attainment. Yeah, we have, we have situations, and I can think of some schools in, in my area where you haven't got a kind of continuity of leadership, for example, because you have got head teachers that have just stayed there for a while and the, the stress is too great, well, the challenge is, is too big and they move on to another school and you have this situation where you have a, a kind of an unstable situation and that, that's not going to improve a school. So how do we, how do we address that? Well, I suppose school to school support as well has already been mentioned and is, is really important. Like when we've when we've done research, um, something that comes out time and time again is that schools want to listen to other schools. They want to take their expertise from other schools more so than you know a, a, a evidence based organisations like ourselves or universities or local authority guidance. So if you can first of all have school to school support to deal with some of those stresses and things like that, but also to build the expertise on what works within schools. Um, we've just set up a, a network of 23 research schools um, south of the border, and the idea is that they are developing intervention support training for heads and for teachers, and it's being shared between schools. I mean, I'll just again, and that's exactly what the Robin Wood Centre has been doing over the past eight years, is working with local authorities and schools to build that capacity locally. Because I think one argument, one strategy could be that you're trying to attract teachers into areas. The question is, are there sufficient teachers, even if you could attract them like that? So I think the more sustainable model is, as we've heard, is to build those clusters, those collaborators of schools, where the whole culture and approach is to focus on quality teaching, building that. And we found that where we've worked with programmes to do uh, what Daniel's been talking about, teachers are enthused. They find that as their practice improves, the, their attainment improves, their motivation goes up and it, it, it has a, a reinforcing effect. And I think if you can get that sustained, where you, you're building that capacity in collaborators of schools to to focus on quality teaching, but also working in partnership with other organisations to tackle some of the other facets of uh, poverty that influence attainment. That's, there seems to be a lot of strong evidence already in Scotland that that, that mm. does work. And coming back to just the, 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 mm. the second part of my, 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 my theme, I suppose, is about the reputation of a school being based on, for example, an inspection result or I, I, I you know, we were talking about low-performing uh, local authorities, mm -hmm. for example. These kind of phrases can put practitioners off. They can demoralise mm -hmm. um, yeah. a, a, yeah. a teaching. They, they can certainly demoralise, and I think that puts an onus on 
the inspectorate, Education Scotland and government about where schools are struggling, to use that term, what's the most appropriate way to, to, to deal with that and what, how, how do we couch that in so that it's seen as a, a form of supporting rather than you know, overt criticism which then demoralises the, the, the local workforce. I think that, so there are the messages about how do we help those schools in, the, in those areas and some may be in challenging areas, it may not be, but how do we help those schools improve? And I think there's, there's a lot of literature, a lot of research evidence about how we do that. We have a track record in Scotland of, of doing this in certain areas. And there's evidence, as Daniel says, further afield. So we know how to do it. It's just putting commitment and resources into that sort of system. And I think importantly for a lot of what we've been talking about is seeing this changing in a real, realistic time scale. Because the impact of building that school system and wider systems up the dividends and the impact on attainment may take a little bit longer to see, mm -hmm. but there's evidence that that, that will happen. Um, Dr McCormack, you started today by saying that child poverty is now rising in Scotland after 20 years. The direction of travel for government policy on funding our schools is towards direct funding. We don't know how far that's going to go, but that's certainly the current uh, direction of travel. Is there any evidence that that direction of travel is the right way to go? So, obviously, um, in England, there's been a move towards more direct funding to schools. Um, I, there's certainly no evidence on which is a better system that, that I'm aware of that, that, um, that I would want to point to here. But certainly, if you do have more direct funding for schools, it gives you an opportunity for to um, make the very best of head teacher and teacher expertise. So we encourage schools um, when they're thinking about how to spend um, resources which they receive directly from government. Uh, we set out a school improvement cycle, if you like. Yeah, so, yeah, but I'm interested in the evidence. I mean, I understand what you're now describing as best practice or things that you're promoting to schools, but this is a committee looking at the evidence to support a, 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 a direction of travel on funding which is, uh, we're now discussing poverty. So do you have any evidence for that, as opposed to just giving us examples, which I'm sure are very good, of just practice? No, I'm, I'm not aware of evidence so, on sort of the comparative. So, so the direction of travel in England, which is much more, as you've started by saying, has gone down the route of funding schools directly. There's no evidence which says that tackles child poverty. Well, it... Um you would have to... Com I, I, I'm not aware of the comparative no, evidence. I don't know myself. where to get it, that's what I'm asking. You, you're not aware of any... Yeah. Okay. And can I ask um, the rest of the panel, um, some of you have mentioned PEF funding, in a team, and I very much took the point that some of you made at the start, that attainment funding, which of course does not go to every school in Scotland, far from it, so many schools don't get any of this at all, um, is, a, is linked but not, but, and therefore related to child poverty, but not the same thing. Um, so do you believe that PEF funding is, is the right way to go? Um, or is, if in terms of tackling child poverty, or is PEF funding something linked and related to it, but not directly related to it? Jim. Yeah. Um, so I see, I see this as, as kind of something we build towards different layers to improve our ability to understand what's happening and our ability to support better practice. So we, we began this, I think, back in 2015, 16, with um, a number of authorities with the highest rates of child poverty mm. based on SIMD. And we were critical of that because we thought that was a very, very blunt way of trying to identify underlying need and opportunity to, to support. Um, then along has come PEF, which is better because it is it does have some kind of household measure of fiscal meal registrations, which is different from entitlement, different from take up. So again, is, is, is a partial, partial way of doing it. Um, I think we would like to see other factors being added to this picture. Um, we know, for example, and we're now making progress, I think in Scotland, in understanding the um, risks uh, that um, looked after children experience across all sorts of outcomes, not least educational outcomes. And so, one could argue that um, uh, we should be doing more to wait towards good interventions that work well with that particular group of children and young people with those, with those experiences. 
There are probably more we could say around um, disability and additional support for learning as well. Um, so my interest is not making this overly complex. It's just that insofar as we want to try and identify um, uh, the need and opportunity to intervene as accurately as possible, um, then, then I think it would be good to see within the National Improvement Framework a kind of over time a really thoughtful approach to how we measure and support. Yeah. Um, and, and I think we have to do that on a geographical basis as well as understanding how it looks like at the school level because uh, local authorities are important in terms of accountability and evening out performance differences over time, at least in theory. Um, and school, the school level is important for what we've heard already about ownership of the issue, knowing your catchment area and deploying resources appropriately within that context. Yeah. Um, so I think we're definitely not there yet, but we're on a journey towards getting into a better place. But you've all persuasively argued that um, youth work, I'm going to summarise, but youth sure. work, child psychology services, um, ultimately the NHS in terms of clinical needs of, of young ch of children, um, uh, um, mental health, so a range of other services that are all funded by government, but broadly through local government, are essential in these underlying causes of poverty. Yeah. If I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but you've broadly said that yeah. in those circumstances, that money to provide those those schools all depend on those services, don't they? My argument is, if we're if we if we go down a route of directly funding schools from centre, that money will not go so much to local government, who have to take that broader view of providing those other services that you've all argued are every bit as essential in terms of of, of tackling these poverty issues. Is that a fair argument, or am I just wrong on this? Okay. I, I would like to say again go back to something you said earlier on about do we know if PEF works? I think it's far too early and we need a national evaluation just as there has been with the attainment challenge. So we, we need to know that's at one level. But drawing on our experience of working closely with schools in different contexts where, where PEF is deployed, as a mechanism it really does depend on how able the school and often the head yeah. teacher and that leadership understands how best to use it and Absolutely. deploy it. Because a head teacher would have the autonomy to deploy to use and bring in services like that. Mm. So their understanding of what works, as we've heard and we've seen in the papers, if leadership teams and teachers were savvy enough to know this, then they could work to deploy that funding in that way. I think our experience is it's far more patchy. I think money will come into schools and it isn't always best used. It, mm. it, it does vary. And again, it goes back to is there some sort of local authority gains? Is the school already working in partnership? So I think you get that patchwork of use of uh, PEF without really a background of a universal understanding of how best to use those And your, your observation earlier on, Mr Loudon, was that, that where schools collaborate and the culture is greatly improved by that, yeah. that, that then feeds through into success, both in terms of tackling poverty, reducing poverty, but also it in terms certainly of tackling the attainment gap. Yes, yeah. it certainly helps. And I think those partnerships can be people you know, like ourselves from, from the academic and research, but also local uh, organisations and local authorities pooling that knowledge, but moving yeah. moving that knowledge across the yeah, system, not, not just in terms of the pedagogies, but how do you use resources? How does a head teacher deploy that resource to get the best impact? Yeah, and is the head teacher the right person to do that? It's That's, that's the key question. Okay. Thank you. And Joanne. I would like to go back to Richard's original question where he was talking about the external factors that uh, don't help or cause the uh, attainment gap. And uh, I'd like to ask John Dickey, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation said the benefit freeze is the single biggest policy driver beyond rising poverty, uh, hitting families in and out of work. Now, I'd like uh, Jim to actually expand on that and actually tell us how that uh, kind of reflects on the attainment uh, gap as well and how uh, how you feel about that. And also, uh, John uh, Dickey, I know how involved you were with the uh, Child Poverty Act and uh, through the Child Poverty Action Group. I'd like to ask, you mentioned that the Child Poverty Delivery Plan can make a big difference as well. Can, can you maybe expand on that as well and tell me how it can actually specifically, you know, relate to uh, this issue we're discussing here today as well? So on, on the, the, the question about the dominant drivers of child poverty in Scotland, and in particular, as John mentioned, the 
projected increase that uh, we're likely to see all things being equal to the end of this decade and beyond. Um, so the, the most consistent finding from, from that evidence is that various aspects of UK social security policy is the single biggest reason for the increase. Um, followed by what's happening at the bottom end of the jobs market. So both those things are in play, uh, not least what's happening in terms of insecurity at work. And much of this increase we know is affecting working families, not just out of work families. Um, so it's about social security and the labour market, but in particular in terms of what governments can do directly. Um, the benefit freeze that I think is meant to be reviewed in a year or two, and that, that has caused great damage in terms of poverty rates already. Um, in terms of how that translates into um, children's experiences at school and life chances, um, there's a very broad dampening effect on how families function. Mm. Um, uh, their, their ability to uh, participate and engage with uh, different systems, including education. Um, but it's back to what I said earlier, that, it, that, that really is variable geographically, and it does depend on partly what education systems are doing across Scotland, but also on how well the housing system is operating and what kind of um, additional support is available at the local level. So if you do have access to excellent welfare advice and rights support, or you have um, a really high quality housing option service uh, on your doorstep, um, then the, the, the way in which these risks translate into life chances will vary. So local services really matter as well in terms of mitigating some of these impacts. Yes, um, so in terms of Child Poverty Act and the Child Poverty Delivery Plan, uh, as I said, uh, the Act now gives us in Scotland something which we don't anymore have in the rest of the UK, which is a clear set of targets towards eradicating child poverty by 2030, uh, a, an accountability mechanism in terms of um, government needing to report uh, to Parliament on progress against its child poverty delivery plans, uh, and also for the first time in Scotland, uh, um, legal responsibilities on local authorities and health boards to produce local action reports uh, in relation to what can be done at a local level to tackle child poverty. And I think within those, there's real scope to think about um, the role of schools, the role of education, um, in terms of the, reducing the costs. Because the, the other, I think, very positive thing about the, 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 the Act and the delivery plan and the approach that's been taken is there's a very, very clear focus now on action to increase the incomes of low-income families and reduce the key costs they face, because it's, it's by doing those that we'll achieve these, these targets. Um, at local level, one way of reducing costs is clearly to reduce uh, costs at school, um, but also there's a role for schools uh, in terms of um, ensuring that the families that they're working with uh, are accessing the full range of supports that they need, including the financial supports. There's education-based financial supports, school clothing grants, free school meals. Um, there's specific reference within the delivery plan towards um, action that will help to optimise payments of school clothing grants and, and free school meals that make access to these education-related benefits um, much more uh, easier and effective and uh, ensure higher take-up. But there's also scope there to build on that and actually look at what are the other supports that that family might be missing out on. And there's good practice, again, examples in, 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 uh, in Scotland where uh, school and family development workers are working with families to not just ensure they're getting the school clothing grant, the free school meals, but also that they're getting the universal credit as it's been ruled out or the other uh, financial supports that, that they're entitled to. So a real role there, a real, a re a real role there within local action reports for um, teasing out the action that can be taken at a local level uh, to um, both maximise incomes, but also remove uh, cost barriers and then the longer term, uh, the wider longer term issue of improving the process, ensuring that all children are able to access um, the, 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 their learning opportunities, that in the longer term, it'll ensure that they are more likely to um, be able to earn and to support them and their children in the future in the longer term in terms of uh, sustaining uh, a lower level of, or uh, sustaining a, a Scotland free of child poverty beyond 2030. 
No, fine. No, OK. okay. Do you want? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to go back to um, well, the two issues. In one round, um, SIMD, and the other round, local authorities. Because, I mean, I hear what you say absolutely about choices being made around um, precarious work and the impact, impact of that. And I think a lack of willingness to address what we now define as positive destinations, which can be very poor uh, working experience for people, but also the benefit system in which you are, you're, you're absolutely right to identify that in terms of um, child poverty. I wonder how have you done any analysis of the impact and the disproportionate cuts to local government on being able, those very agencies that want to support young people and address the question of poverty, their capacity to do so because you know, it's one thing to say, well, a young person should have access to a grant if local authorities are under massive pressure. Has there been any work done looking at what the, what the choices are that local authorities are making in the context of a lack of resources? Does anybody want to respond to that? Mr. McCormack. Uh, um, so over the last um, possibly four or five years, we, we've worked with Glasgow University and some others who have developed a really um, practical um, toolkit for local government, which helps them um, for any kind of budget outlook to work out the best way to um, protect low-income people in places um, as far as possible. And this was um, uh, co-produced with, I think, four or five local authorities across Britain, including Renfrewshire and some of the larger cities in England, um, which over that period faced quite different budget reductions. So there was a real budget reduction in the Scottish example, but it was much less than in Newcastle or Coventry or other parts of, of, of England that were included. Um, but if you roll forward, what we see is that different councils in Scotland, um, urban areas, but also Highland in the last couple of years, um, using this um, to try and really identify how to um, ideally proactively um, assist and improve, but as, as, a, as a minimum to limit the damage that can be done when budgets are falling. Um, and, and again, it's back to the point about data and knowing how to deploy your resources when they're under pressure. Um, it really does matter that um, both the financial support that can be available through grants and other types of support, but also the in-kind value of high quality services um, has a much bigger value for low-income communities than for everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, and so to be able to, in a very mindful way, when you're drawing up draft budgets, um, uh, run the numbers and know with some, some degree of accuracy what, what's the different impact of different budget choices, mm -hmm. I think has been... I mean, it hasn't affected the budget settlement, but it has affected how you use what's available to you in a more thoughtful way than we saw maybe in previous uh, spending rounds. Mm -hmm. Yes, Karen. Just like I say, I think we've seen it on the ground, what John's talking about there. Again, goes back to that patchy distribution of the skills and the knowledge of how, how to use the often dwindling resources to best effect. I think we, we see that. But what we've noticed in our research working with schools is that I mentioned infrastructure before such as that might be advisors locally in the education system it might be local support workers uh, the cuts have definitely had an effect on that availability so what the effect is then tracing that back down the way to look at attainment in schools I think that's, the, that's harder to, to look at that mm -hmm. but certainly in terms of the the feedback from school and teachers and head teachers, they see this as very much affecting their ability to tackle the attainment challenge, this reduction in the available infrastructure that helps them do what, what they need to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm struck by the fact that some of the things you described, we were doing 25 years ago. Yeah. Strathclyde Regional Council was very radical in a lot of the work that it did, but if you speak to people now anecdotally about the supports that are in school, they have gone. And you know that the extent to which people are talking about, you know, young people with additional support needs not being appropriately supported, and it's it, my concern is I want to ask a question about this, is that we we both recognise a systemic problem, mm -hmm. but we then talk about individual solutions. If there was only a Mr. Chips in every school, everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. When in fact it is about systemic. 
approaches as opposed to just about individual quality or individual quality matters. But can I ask this question about SIMD? Because, you know, uh, Dr McCormick's not the first person who's come along and said it's a very blunt instrument, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't address where, the f where young people are um, impoverished. Would your own figures suggest that if you're a young per person living in a relatively um, well-off area, but you yourself are disadvantaged, your outcomes are better, and therefore SIMD is a good measure because even if you are yourself in good work and not impoverished and are very supported by your family in a school where there's an intensity of poverty that, that then impacts on your local service, whether it's your, your, your doctor's surgery or the pressure on the school or whatever, that impacts on you, even though your own family circumstances are relatively supported. And I wonder whether you have done any work. Or is it fair for me to say that actually it's not a blunt instrument if you're looking at systemic problems around poverty and impact of poverty on communities, even where individual families themselves are not in poverty? <coughs> Shall I have, have a go at that one? That, I think that's a really great question, actually, and a good challenge back. Um, I think SMD is really helpful in identifying what you've just said about the variations in across what we're calling deprived areas. Um, uh, and that does map on to some degree onto places doing well or not doing well. So, so um, helpful in that sense. Less helpful in one sense, though, which is that when we look at um, how children growing up in deprived areas are faring, um, uh, there's a risk that we then take that as a as, as kind of shorthand for low-income families or families in poverty. And there is some correlation, but it really depends where you are. If you go to rural Scotland, the correlation is very weak indeed. If you go to urban areas, the correlation is much stronger. Um, I think it's interesting that when you look at the indicator that I've focused in on here about level five passes, um, you know, you've got Western Bartonshire, Inverclyde, North Ayrshire, North Lanarkshire, um, um, really bucking the trend, if you like, and beating the odds, at least in that one single indicator. Can I ask if you mean they're bucking the trend as, a, as in contrast with, say, Glasgow? Is it that they are, are they bucking a trend yeah. in the areas round about them? You could argue, yeah. for example, that Glasgow draws the challenge yeah. to it because it's a city yeah. and the, the areas round about it perhaps have not well, quite the same pressure. Or is it bucking the trend across Scotland or beyond that? It, it, so if, if, you, if you look at the, um, let's say, the top quarter of authorities with the highest rates of child poverty, which, which is where we began the attainment challenge, just for the purpose of illustration, um, then they, they are distributed differently. But, but, but Glasgow is above average, actually, on this indicator, too. I think it's really striking that areas like North Ayrshire that have been do struggling for such a long time with the economy, with participation rates in the job market and so on, with very high rate of child poverty, is nonetheless faring better than relatively some relatively affluent parts of Scotland. And so the, the kind of system around about you in terms of the strain on transport, on housing, on, on welfare support, and absolutely it is, is a material factor. Um, but it's still quite interesting, and maybe surprising, that, that some of the authorities who, are, who appear to be doing better on that measure are clearly, and, and we've, we've taken a three-year running average, so it's not a single year's data, uh, they must be doing something which other authorities could be learning from as long as the comparisons are, are fair and appropriate. And I take from that a really, it's a really actually an encouraging picture that authorities which don't have the challenges to seek are, despite all of that, um, and this is no indication of what's, what's going to happen in the future, but for now, are, are managing to, to maybe outperform what on paper we might expect. And in contrast some authorities that ought to be faring better aren't and the final thing I would say is despite the long-term nature of how change happens the other encouraging thing is that 
some authorities which have been struggling in that indicator are starting to improve quite quickly. And that may be a trend or it may not be a trend, but the, the, there are lots of hopeful things, even with this very narrow way of measuring attainment, I think that we can take away. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ruth. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'd like to ask about the cost of a school day, but first of all, um, Daniel Mason, in your opening um, answer, you said that 10% um, of schools in England are um, managing to achieve what we're trying to achieve. So I suppose the obvious question is, what are they doing? Well, I think it comes back to this focus on what's happening inside the classroom, and I think this links really nicely with, with what you said. And it's not, it's not about trying to put in opposition the wider issues of deprivation with what a school can do. Both are very important, but there clearly are a set of things that a school can do around teaching and learning, which make a difference for children, even if they are experiencing other unacceptable impacts of poverty. And the evidence suggests that the best things that schools can do are the things that really impact on the relationship between the teacher and the pupil in the classroom. So um, I don't have the evidence on what those schools are doing in the classroom that's different to other schools, but we do have very good, high-quality evidence that the types of things that you do with pupils, which are around um, high-quality feedback, as I said, um, uh, uh, metacognition, understanding the process of learning um, for both the pupil and the teacher, making really good use of collaborative learning and peer tutoring, uh, well-structured targeted interventions, always focusing on pupil needs and when pupil starts to fall behind, well-targeted catch-up, good deployment of teaching assistance in the classroom to target individual pupil needs rather than using them as general classroom help. So there's a range of things that schools are doing. And I suppose another thing that's really important is that it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's about exactly, as Kevin was saying, the ability of heads and other senior leaders to diagnose what's needed in a particular school and deliver that. Thank you. Um, we had quite a weight of evidence about the, the cost of a school day and that's, that's Im that its impact on families. So I suppose I'd just like to hear um, more of your own reflections on that. I think I was um, particularly struck by, um, I think it was Unison spoke about, if you've had the opportunity to see a play as well as um, read about it or read out loud, that it's going to you know, you're going to do better at interpreting it, and, and therefore better in your in your work. So that was one of the one of the things that that, that, that struck me, um, and I suppose it's that bit as well that which um, Joanne Lament touched on about the extent which education is actually free if if parents and families have to provide additional things, um, so that, that their kids can get the most out of education that they're participating in. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the. the the reality is that too often education isn't free. What's offered in school isn't free. Um, pupils and families are being charged for it, including for materials for courses, course materials. So particular areas in the work that we've done um, across Scotland where there seems to be a real issue with charging for materials in home economics, technical, um, art and design, um, also in drama as well. So examples of uh, the cost of you know, as part of the curriculum, uh, you need to go and see. You actually go and go and you know, there's reading plays. You're going to see plays. You're going to, um, and uh, the, the the cost barrier actually excluding young people from being able to do that. Um, so real evidence of pupils then actually uh, young people actually making subject choices influenced by costs and young people themselves saying that's had an impact. Young people and teachers um, saying that they've witnessed that having an impact on subject choices. Um, so that's one area where a very clear charge of materials. And the good news is that there are schools and local authorities who have now made decisions just to scrap those charges and not to charge for those. And then teachers reporting increased participation in those subjects, increased enthusiasm, motivation. So by taking away that charge, they've seen a, they've seen a difference already in terms of young people's participation. In, in Charging for CFE stuff, is that common? Yes. I mean, as far as the, in the work we've done, uh, we've done significant work in Glasgow, Dundee, and work in other local authority areas, and uh, charging for materials for um, you know, ingredients for home economics, 
um, uh, materials for art design, um, charging for trips to the theatre as part of uh, English and uh, um, uh, drama courses, absolutely. Uh, now, there's a variability in terms of the extent to which schools will try and identify those pupils that might need some additional support or to what extent those pupils are left behind, but that's, that's very variable. Um, and the reality is pupils and teachers themselves saying pupils are making subject choices on that, on that basis. Yeah, so that, okay. And then other, uh, other, in other areas, and again, this maybe comes back in terms of the overall funding package, where schools do attempt to try and reduce those costs or remove those costs, then kids are then complaining that all they ever get to do is bake the cheapest things rather than they know kids at other schools that maybe have a more mix and more, more, more resources available uh, are doing more interesting uh, things um, uh, in classes. So no question about it, people, pupils are being, families are being charged. And I think there's two things. There's the direct children actually missing out on those subjects or not being able to participate, or their, 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 their sense of enjoyment, their ability their, <laughs> to, to, to enjoy those subjects, knowing that it's causing a stress for them and their families to be able to fully participate. Um, is diminished, but it's also obviously reducing the disposable incomes available as families to meet all their other needs in terms of uh, paying the bills, buying food, all the rest of it, uh, and sustaining uh, their uh, home. My, uh, my apologies, Ruth. Yeah. So that, I mean, I think that's the most direct way where it's actually course materials are being charged for. Mm -hmm. um, the other big one that uh, is, is school, school trips, and particularly the P7 residential trip, which um, absolutely major part of young people talking about how big a part of P7 this is, the, the residential trip, and this is a, 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 in local authorities across Scotland. Um, but that's, you know, uh, uh, over £300 in some cases, well over £300 in some cases. I mean, again, variability, how much is charged for it, but it's, it is charged for. Um, and again, across Scotland, evidence of children being left behind, not participating in that school trip. In one local authority area, we did a survey of the schools, uh, on average, three or four pupils in every school, in every P7 class, not participating in the, in, in the P7 residential. I mean, you hear young people's describing how big a part of P7 that is, that's, that's the impact that I must have on that young person, those young people left behind, sense of school and sense of education and what it has to offer. Um, I mean, we don't have a, a direct measure of what impact that has on long-term attainment. It's hard to believe that doesn't uh, have, a, have, 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 a, have, a, have an impact. Um, so I think there is a question here about um, not just at school level and at local authority level, but at national level, what do we mean by a free education system in Scotland? Um, and it was interesting to the SPICE report flagging up there's actually legislative underpinning suggesting that school should be um, free, and in fact, uh, it's not. So what do we need to put in place to ensure uh, wherever you live in Scotland, actually, we've got a clear understanding of what is the core curriculum, what is it that school should offer to every young person, and we ensure that, that there is no financial barrier, that that is free to all, to all pupils. It has particular relevance, I think, if you look at the, the research literature on what works, as, we, as we've heard, some of the, the strategies that make an impact on those more disadvantaged students and help close the attainment gap are what they call enrichment uh, opportunities and experiences where students who are normally disadvantaged get the opportunity to, to experience things they wouldn't, whether it's culture, museums, outdoor experiences. There's, there's a research evidence to say that that does make an impact. So that makes it all the more crucial that those opportunities should be part of the strategy a school and local authority and government uses as, as, as its repertoire to, to tackle some of the issues we're talking about. So if the cost of the school day, you know, if, if that does impact on schools' ability to do that, then that, that is quite a key issue. Mm -hmm. They seen firsthand in uh, North Ayrshire is in my area. Um, I should probably mention their professional learning academy is a, a step that probably impacts on um, the good results they're having. But in terms of um, activities for young people, there's a really strong Duke of Edinburgh um, groups and, and youth work that goes on, and, and you can you can see how um, how the good that it's doing doing for the young people. I suppose as a follow up question, and we mentioned there that there is legislative underpinning for free education, but is there something more we need to be doing nationally in terms of policy to make sure that education is properly free and that everyone has the same opportunities? I think it, it, if you read most of the education policy documents and major policy strategies, they're very coherent, the interlink, they're very holistic, and you couldn't argue it at a sort of systems level with a lot of that. I think the, the challenge is there 
translation into reality, in operationalization at school and local level. And perhaps the, the funding and resources use uh, that are needed to translate that policy into reality and do need scrutiny. And you know, if we're saying this is what the policy is to, to achieve those objectives, mm -hmm. but then we look at the system that's out there and the resources that are there, is there an alignment there? I think there's some argument that there, there might be mismatch and that if we're serious about translating those policies into action and uh, tackling some of these targets we've talked about today, then we need to go back and say, is the system we see and some of the pressures it's under, uh, what do we need to change there to make that happen? I think there is a role for sort of a greater national steer and a review of what we think is acceptable and not acceptable in terms of charging for um, school activities um, or school uh, broader school trips and others. Absolute clear understanding of what what is and what isn't acceptable. Um, a clear steer that it isn't acceptable. If if the P7 residential is such a core part of primary education, which it, it is, then. That the, at national level, it's absolutely made clear that there's, it's unacceptable that any child misses out on that because of uh, financial barriers, um, and that then local authorities and schools are supported to be able to make sure that happens in whatever way it needs to it needs to happen. But I think a clear, we do need to have a kind of a national steer and a national uh, direction on this, um, and I think there's also a role in terms of uh, the school support and inspection regime in terms of making sure that barriers to learning, financial bar cost barriers to full participation are an, are an explicit and intrinsic part of that process of inspection and support to schools, um, and that schools are, are held to account uh, on that and are supported to. And again, this is kind of getting the balance right. There's lots of good examples, lots of good things that individual schools are doing um, and that are sharing with other schools, but there's also a kind of accountability thing, I think, at national level to make sure that wherever, you, wherever you're going to school in Scotland, you're not missing out because you can't afford to participate in what that school uh, is offering. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Ross, uh, and would you like to go on to your next yeah, question? Thank you, sir? Convener. Um, I'd like to come back to um, the point that John made around income maximisation, which I think is really quite key to this. It goes back to the point made at the start that poverty is a challenge that children arrive at school with. And as much as there's a huge amount that can be done within the school environment, it's largely to mitigate and compensate for the effects of poverty. Um, it's a whole system approach that's needed to actually tackle the poverty itself. There was a lot of quite compelling evidence in the Joseph Rowntree uh, submission around the impact of income maximisation. I was wondering if you'd be able to expand on what the role of schools is in facilitating that whole system approach that allows, for, exam for example, income maximisation projects to actually reach the families they need to. As I've already flagged up, I think there is more that individual schools can do to promote uh, and ensure that young people in their school uh, are accessing the school clothing grant, the free school meals, the educational maintenance allowances, the supports that are already there, but which aren't actually being fully taken up. And sometimes it's quite hard, I know even from my own experience, it's quite hard to see where any information about free school meal entitlement or school clothing grant is that's quite often left, I think, to sort of discretion and uh, individual teachers or school staff um, promoting that or it being on a website, but a kind of far more proactive um, a, a role for schools in ensuring uh, people are pay taking up their entitlements. Interesting, PEF funding has driven I, I, I think because it's based on free school meal um, entitlement, it's actually driven an increased focus on schools to ensure that children are registering for free school meals. So that's a, um, but that should be happening anyway, and it should be happening in relation to school clothing grant and educational maintenance, uh, maintenance licenses as well. And I suppose on the back of that, again, I'm repeating myself, examples of where um, staff within schools, um, so family support development workers uh, in Dundee, for example, uh, are actively supporting families to maximise their incomes on top of those specific um, uh, education-related uh, income supports. So a real, a real role there in terms of uh, schools being able to um, uh, ensure that the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that the children that they're working with, that their families are getting all the financial support that, they, um, that they're entitled to, to help enable, ensure that they're able to fully participate in the school day. So it's kind of linking schools, as a, and I think there's a, as a mainstream uh, universal service with wider 
um, income maximisation and local money advice and welfare rights projects, uh, there's potential there to develop those links. And there are, again, individual schools um, and, and, and in different local authority areas doing that. Um, so I think it's about learning what works most effectively, because um, it is a difficult thing that teachers and heads not necessarily wanted to have conversations about people's individual finances, but finding the language, finding the way of engaging with parents around what are the, what are the issues they're facing that might be preventing their, their child from fully participating at school, and then offering the support to ensure that they're getting the, the, the financial support that they're entitled to. I think one very real example where we've seen that work over the last four or five years is we've, we've been evaluating a programme in, in Renfrewshire, Families First programme, yeah. and one of the range of services and work, embedded workers they have working with schools has been a, a, an income advice uh, as well as energy advice and other specialists who will liaise with parents often in these challenging circumstances to, to see what their entitlement is and to then advocate and support their access to those. And that, that's made a, a huge difference in uh, funding claim, monies claimed, and then the impact of that funding, getting people out of real chaos, you know, really serious situations that I was affecting the whole family as well as the education of their children and turning situations around. So I think schools often don't have the advice to hand, but where they can work very closely with embedded services and workers in these place-based approaches, I think we've found that to be very effective. It seems like a... Sorry, John. Uh, Jim, was I about to cut you off there? I'm just going to make a supplementary point, which is just that... I mean, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, 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 the evidence internationally in the UK is, is really, really clear and consistent over decades that for low-income families, increasing resources, so both driving down costs and boosting income, um, uh, has positive effects on child cognition, it has positive effects on attainment and so on. So schools have a stake in this stuff. It's not just a kind of nice thing to do. In the margins, it will actually, if we get it right, it will have a direct impact on, on what, what, if you like, their core, their core mission is. I mean, just an additional point on what Kevin said, what, what, what we've learned about how to do this well is stop passing vulnerable families from pillar to post mm -hmm. to get the support they need. The more we can do this using co-location models, which might be the school, although I think I would suggest that secondary schools are pretty daunting places for the majority of families, not just low-income families, to cross the threshold and have these kind of conversations. It might be schools, um, but it, it absolutely should be um, primary care, based on what we've seen in Glasgow and Bryn Dundee, and it might be other, play, other settings as well. But wherever people go in their daily lives, if we can design um, you know, confidential, high-quality gateways that will get them uh, quick access to the kind of support they need, both financial and non-financial, that stuff works, it's cost-effective, it gets people the support they need at the right time. And, and so um, we're in a good place in terms of knowing how to design these interventions well so that they will work for the families we're talking about. It seems like PEF would be ideally suited as a way to, to facilitate uh, this and to make sure that schools are, are involved in this approach. Taking on board what's already been mentioned, that we're not yet in a place to, to fully evaluate that. From what you've seen so far, are schools being supported to take these kind of approaches? I mean, certainly, anecdotal evidence that I've came across is very much where the local authority is taking that kind of approach, um, it's working very well because they are able to ensure that every school or the schools that need to are, are facilitating it. But on that individual school by school level, and it goes back to Tavi Scott's point about is the direction of travel towards individual schools taking these decisions, are schools being supported and provided with that knowledge? It's not knowledge that teachers will, or head teachers even, will often naturally have to hand. I think that, I think that, that, that is exactly the issue. It's, it's the, the the knowledge of the, the school team, in a secondary school, might be the pastoral team as well as the, the school leadership team. And that varies. Often where there's been a history locally of the school working with these services, there tends to be a knowledge base about who can help them. But often that landscape of those support agencies is in flux, you know, with, with cutbacks. A lot of the, the services that schools would have traditionally uh, reached out to are no longer there or they're, they're, they're greatly reduced. So there's the issue about the existence of support, 
but where it does exist, you often find there is a need for coordination and raising awareness of that, because teachers will not always know about the existence of those and how, how best to use them. So as, as we've heard, these co-located, as, as, as uh, Jim was saying, we know about the models where how best to set these services up uh, and align them with what schools do and, and make it more holistic uh, is perhaps the best way rather than schools having to look around and think, where would I find the support? I think it... Oh, sorry. Ross, are you suggesting that, the, that some local authorities are instructing uh, head teachers how to use their PEF money? No, were the, were the local authorities not using it? It has not done it through PEF, where they have separately initiated and, and facilitated income maximisation across their schools. But the, the point is that where schools are, could use PEF to do this, some schools are because they know it's an option. But there are schools that have PEF money, but the head teacher simply doesn't have the knowledge that income maximisation would be an effective way to spend that money because no one has advised them that it would be an effective way to spend it. Yeah. Okay, that's not what I found, but I, I, I just want a clarification. That yeah. was all. That, that's, thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I just think it's worth um, reiterating that um, the kind of things that we're talking about, income maximisation and poverty alleviation and spending money and resources and time in schools and around schools on those is um, absolutely essential, but it is it's necessary but not sufficient. So all the barriers to learning and to parental engagement that you alleviate through those kind of measures, it's necessary, but it's not enough. You've then also got to have the, the focus on the good teaching and the good interventions in the classroom to make the most of it. You know, once children have enough to eat in the morning and you know, aren't being stigmatised for certain things and aren't missing out on trips, then there's the additional thing of the actual focus on learning to get the attainment outcomes that you want. Yes, that was just in terms of PEF funding, examples of individual schools using that money to reduce costs, to remove costs for school trips, to get rid of those uh, costs for ingredients for home economics, for example, uh, investing in um, uh, breakfast clubs to ensure that children have got something to eat before they start their, their school day. So there's individual examples of PEF being used in ways that reduces uh, reduces costs at school. Um, that uh, is great, and I think it needs to be supported. I think there is does need to be more um, kind of support and guidance to 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 to, to support uh, individual schools in terms of that work and make sure that these things are not subject to a an individual funding stream um, or to the decisions of uh, uh, basically that, that, these, that these things aren't you know a, a subject of you know good practice or a, uh, individual bits of good practice or a subject to a, a funding stream that actually become the absolute norm in schools across Scotland that we just all the time schools are just look, re reflecting reviewing and removing any financial barrier to participation. Parental engagement now, please. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you, Camille. Um, there has been quite a, a bit of interesting evidence submitted around the impact of uh, parental en engagement. I'd like to specifically look at um, homework as an example. This is something that's come up a number of times that where there are issues of parental confidence in engaging with the, the homework of their children, there's a quite a significant knock on effect to, to the attainment of those children, a very clear link with poverty there. Um, I was wondering if you would be able to, to expand on what that impact is and if you have seen from the evidence a difference uh, between uh, children and, and families who are in poverty but not in an area of deprivation um, so where the parents themselves may uh, come from that background but are not uh, the, the school is generally a high achieving school in an area not of that background compared to where it is an area of deprivation where these uh, challenges are, are common for a number of families in their community, and if that has any effect on the levels of parental engagement with issues like homework. So I don't know of any evidence on that specific distinction. Um, obviously, parental engagement is a, you know, it is is a crucial factor. Um, other people on the panel will know, you know, as much or, or more as me about the importance of it in terms of its impact. Um, one thing we found is that despite the, the very, very strong evidence about the impact on parental engagement, the evidence on how to use parental engagement to improve attainment is much 
weaker. So um, we have tested some interventions which aim to bring parents either into schools or to sessions in, in other places to improve engagement with their children's learning or to teach specific sort of parenting skills to do with learning. And those tend not to be particularly effective in, in, in our experience of high quality trials that we've done so far. There's a challenge around actually engaging the parents that you want to reach. And then there's a challenge around the types of interventions that are going to be effective. So it is difficult for schools to find really good ways to get good parental engagement. Um, on the other hand, we've tested an intervention, and it's just one, and it's just an, uh, you know, it's a first trial that we've done, where parents were texted um, with prompts to encourage them to engage with their children's homework or tests that children have coming up. And it was very, very low cost, very low resource, and had an impact on both attainment and attendance. So there are some things coming through that schools can do to kind of, that schools can try to increase that engagement. On homework in particular, there's probably just <coughs> one interesting thing, well, one interesting thing that I have to add is that there's obviously the parental background and parental attainment and the ability to support your children doing homework. There's also material issues. So if a child just doesn't have, if they share their bedroom with a number of siblings and don't have anywhere quiet to do homework, or if they have caring responsibilities because of the nature of their family. So there's material issues that impact upon the um, the impact and um, effect of homework as well as the uh, sort of parental ability issues. So just, just to re reiterate that, I think when we talk about parental engagement, it, it's a wide spectrum. It's you know, what we mean by meaningful, effective parental engagement. And I think some schools really find to get to that, it's about building relationships first with those parents and where those relationships have been built up and those parents who might be reticent about approaching the school for whatever reason, where they've had success in that, then involving those parents in the, in the learning of their children is often a lot more effective and, and productive in terms of outcomes. So I, I, I don't know, I agree, I th I don't, I'm not sure that, that there's evidence that specifically links um, poverty, place and attainment quite in that way, but I think what, 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 what we can say something about is the kind of intermediate outcomes that are probably on the pathway to uh, uh, attainment gains if other things are in place. And, and so these, these kind of prior conditions that have to be got right really matter. I could think of an example of um, you know, schools where there's a problem with, let's say, first and second year, boys not turning up to school, getting into trouble. There's a real issue actually about P7 to S2 transitions for another day perhaps. But, but in the past, what schools have tried to do is bilaterally, with individually, by family, by family, try and say there's a problem here, can you sort this out, can we work with you? Not getting very far. But the breakthrough comes when you socialise that problem and you say you're not alone as a family. Other families are in the same boat. How can we bring you together, work with you, empower you and empower each other on a peer-to-peer -peer basis, um, making the whole thing less scary, um, uh, uh, changing the power dynamics because there are particular power dynamics about how schools interact with families, especially when things are going off track. And I think that although that's in the, in the kind of category of promising rather than proven as a way of working, I think there, there, there are some interesting signals in there about culture and power sharing um, that really matter for families generally, but especially for families who are having a tough time in terms of poverty. The other example I would give is when schools, as they increasingly do, are providing study support during the Easter holidays or after school or homework clubs, um, Often teachers will have in mind the kind of children they, they really want to turn up to get the extra support. And when those children don't turn up, we can either say they didn't turn up, they're not interested, or we can, or we can ask ourselves, well, what could we do to reduce the barriers? Would it help if we were able to support their travel home later in the day? Would it help if we fed those kids? Would it help if we approached them as peer groups, so them and their friends invited, not just individually. There are all sorts of things at that granular level where we can ask ourselves, you know, it's not just enough to provide an opportunity, we have to ask ourselves, how do we 
make that opportunity genuinely accessible. Uh, when we do that well at the school level, and it does need supported by local authority to do it consistently, um, we get better outcomes. So we just have to be much more mindful about how these opportunities are um, um, uh, experienced by families and, and make it more of an invitation than simply a kind of passive opportunity to be involved in the education of your child. You can get a chance to respond at, at that time. Eh? You, you finish your process? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Follow on um, fr from that point because I think if you picked any handful of schools across Scotland and visited them and asked them about the level of parental engagement, every single school would say there are parents that are engaged with the school and there are parents that are not. And it's not a new issue. I remember when my sons were at school, I used to see the same group of parents um, and there was parents that never ever attended the school and there are a number of reasons for the lack of parental engagement and it's not just because of poverty and, and deprivation and I think that's a, a really important point to make. Um, you can't point a finger at, at parents that come from a deprived area and say that's the reason you're not engaging with the school. But if you think it's the school's responsibility to improve that, that engagement, what should the schools be doing? Because this is an issue that's gone on for a long time. And if there is a link between parental engagement and attainment, surely schools should be de doing more. So what should they be doing? Can I please offer one particular example? And it's, it's the later end of the school year. So the earlier we do this, the better. But my example is we looked at how aspirations form amongst teenagers going to schools in different kind of catchment areas um, in Glasgow and other parts of, of, of the UK. Because we were trying to understand this kind of shorthand that's out there about poverty ambition, poverty of aspiration. And we found the evidence was really weak on that, actually. What we found was um, uh, all kinds of families from all kinds of backgrounds, you're quite right, start off with high aspirations for their children. The reasons why they go off track is something to do with having connections and knowledge and know-how about turning those aspirations for your children into reality. So the example I give from Glasgow is if, if, if your aspiration is to, I don't know, become a mechanic um, or become, uh, or go into the professions or whatever it happens to be, uh, those families who have those connections and that understanding of how to get their children really good quality work experience at 16 um, and so on, uh, are far more likely controlling for qualifications to achieve those uh, mm -hmm. career choices in later life than those who lack those connections. And what schools can do is try and even up that disparity by really focusing on building know-how within the school, improving the quality and consistency of careers advice, which frankly is very, very patchy all mm -hmm. these years after we knew there was a problem. Um, and um, recognising that, get, given that parents do have those aspirations, um, engaging with them earlier, more consistently about that scary moment of, of subject choices, those scary moments about exams and scary moments before your children leave school. I think we're leaving families who really need the support kind of on their own too often mm. uh, to navigate a complex landscape and schools that absolutely could do better consistently. So do you think schools should have almost a continuing and ongoing dialogue with parents? I, I absolutely do. I think, I think we, we too easily fall back upon representative structures, mm. which is a very small number by definition of families who will be involved in the life of the school. My experience anecdotally is I'm asked to get involved with my daughter's high school <clears throat> if there's a problem when they want money. Mm -hmm. So that's not good enough. We yeah. need to have an on, we need to have many, many different invitations from schools to be involved in how all sorts of things can be improved, as well as more relational approaches when things are going off track, mm. um, in ways that make families feel they, they can be part of the solution. Um, uh, and and the, the, the hopeful thing is that we've got really good evidence in Scotland on what happens when you build a culture, culture participation in, in mm. different schools mm -hmm. from the Children's Commissioner from three or four years ago. Um, this stuff, when it's done well, really works, really makes a difference. I can't tell you the link into attainment, but I can certainly tell you about the links into these intermediate outcomes about family confidence, mm -hmm. good choices, um, uh, when you've got you know, a link into good quality careers advice, 
uh, good, consistent early work experience, it really makes a difference to confidence and motivation. Just, just before I, I can, can I just make one very brief point before I let the other panel members in. How much of an impact then does does a parent's experience of, of school have on the way they treat the relationship yeah. with their, their, their child's school? I don't know the I don't know the sort of quantitative evidence of it, but obviously you know anecdotal mm. evidence from um, the projects that we do is that it's very important and it's a big barrier to engaging precisely the group of parents who you might want to in terms of attainment mm. and 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 that then i think comes back to exactly what jim was speaking about which is making um making it as easy as possible for parents to engage mm -hmm. okay. okay we know from research with uh, in, in, in adult education what, what forms adults perceptions of education mm -hmm. childhood experiences of, of education it doesn't devalue their, 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 their vision of the, the utility of education but their confidence to approach mm. schools is, is definitely affected and I think that then will then pass on to how they engage with schools and working with schools what really works going back to that, that theme about relationship building with the local community where you have had teachers and teachers who will get the message across to the local community that their doors are always open mm. and really you know invite parents to just come in and as far as they can even though head teachers are very busy that message then does get into the community over time that the head teacher will sit down and talk to them so you build that relationship up in the community it's easier for primary schools to do that it's much more difficult i think given the structures in, in, in secondary mm -hmm. schools to do that but perhaps not impossible but i think that building those relationships with parents over time is is, is key to that okay. yeah um just, a, I suppose, a couple of examples from our work of ways in which parents and parents who maybe traditionally haven't been involved uh, in, in, in school or engaging with their, their, their children's education directly with the school. Um, we've been involved in a couple of bits of work um, undertaking participatory budgeting exercises where a pot of money has been set aside uh, for the school to, to use to reduce financial barriers to participation and parents and children themselves have been involved in actually deciding what are the key issues and what that money should be spent on. So examples in Glasgow and uh, just ongoing in Midlothian at the moment. So don't have long term, don't have the data, the evidence of the long term, but it seems like a way that potentially brings parents in to be able to make real choices actually about how money is spent that might help make school more um, accessible um, for their young people and uh, boost participation. Another thing I suppose we came up um, against was we were doing a lot of work in schools with pupils and with teachers. Um, and actually what came up was quite often there's pressure from parent councils for trips, activities, fundraising activities. And it was those things that were actually creating financial pressures for, um, uh, for, 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 on, on pupils and making it difficult for young people. So we've developed a, a, a toolkit for parent councils and engaged with parent councils to develop a toolkit to support parent councils themselves to look at how can they engage in a, a more diverse <laughs> group of parents in, in their activities, but also to, to, to support them to reflect on and think through how their work um, might impact and the things that they're doing uh, impact on children from lower income families. Um, and again, that toolkit's out there uh, jointly now produced for at national level with um, the National Parent Forum. So it's, it's something that's there to support parents and I, and I think something that we can, we can build on. Thank you very much. You, you know, we've got a few people left that, who still want to ask questions and we've got a very tight time scale. So Ruth, you want to come in very briefly? Very briefly, thank you, convener. It, just in terms of parental engagement, it's a term that makes me shudder a wee bit sometimes would, would you acknowledge that actually there are parents who are maybe not on the parent council or in and out of the school but that we need to value the contribution that they made they make to their children's education by reading with them by talking about their activities of the day that it's not just that kind of set thing that maybe springs to mind about being on the parent council and lobbying for you know trips or whatever the different thing is that actually the value that they add to their children's education can be through other ways as well you won't be surprised to hear that I think that's the most important type of parental engagement. It's, yeah. it's the engagement with the learning rather than being on the school council or at the school gate. Yeah. 
We've got examples of schools supporting that and with good feedback in terms of providing um, home lending packs during the school holidays. They'll engage parents and uh, of interest to parents and good feedback from parents parents on, on that and um, providing support books for the parents as well as kind of uh, materials for the young people materials for, for parents as well in terms of particular subjects. A math support book was one example that was given to us by a school, again, with positive feedback from parents and teachers saying they've seen a, an increased um, level of engagement in those subjects as a result. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, a number of the points I, I was going to raise have, have already sort of come up, so I'll, I'll try and keep it a bit shorter. Um, I was going to ask you talk about the importance of that teaching and learning uh, relationship. I mean, my experience when speaking to, to teachers, certainly within my own constituency, is that a huge amount of their time is taken up with activities that are not teaching or learning based. Um, is, is that something that you, you come across nationally and in, and in research? Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a big problem. It comes up when you speak to teachers. A, a good example is um, marking and marking practices. So um, it's become um, common practice to, I don't know, if, uh, triple impact marking is a practice where a teacher marks a book, the child responds to the marking and then the teacher responds. It's a way of demonstrating that you've had interaction with the pupil and given them feedback, but it's an incredibly resource intensive one, one with very little evidence behind it. So marking is a particular example where people are doing very resource intensive things with very little evidence of impact. And I think that there's a range of things. It's really about schools um, not spending time and resources on things that have not been shown to be effective just because they feel there's pressure to do so and focusing on the areas where we know things are cost effective. And how do you break that cycle? Do you have any practical sort of advice? So um, I think that um, watchdogs and, and the like can, can be clear about the fact that um, on the marking example, it's not illustrating that you've done the marking that is the important thing. It's the fact that you've had good feedback with your children and that could have been oral feedback in the class. So we need that we need to remove pressure on schools to be seen to do certain things that are not evidence-based and we need to get to heads, teachers, local authorities, good evidence on the most effective way to spend their ta teacher time and resources. I think in the Scottish context, that guidance and steer will come from Education Scotland and government. I think that I think unless teachers feel they are safe to do this, and it, it's, it's not seen as some sort of accountability measure, then only then do they feel if the message from leadership, whether it's school, local authority, and education of Scotland, if there's a culture that, yes, that's what you should be doing to maximise the impact on, on learning, then teachers will do that. I think in schools where you have very strong leadership, they may resist certain pressures, and, but in, in the absence of those type of environments i think the only the only uniform way a generalizable way is to have that steer come down from from senior leadership okay thank you the, the other thing i wanted to go back to was uh, the sort of area based uh, deprivation and the sort of different differing links do you think that there's a case uh, for rurality uh, being used as a as an indicator uh, of, of of likely attainment is there is the evidence or the sort of correlation strong enough to, to start looking at that? I think in our research, and again, I think we lack generalizable research, but in terms of working on programs and pilot programs in, in different areas, we've been made very aware over the decades of the particular challenges of schools in, in rural areas about accessing resources, accessing services that other schools might use to, to promote learning of all learners, not just. Uh, those in uh, attainment challenge areas. Uh, and these challenges are persistent. They, they, I think they need particular attention, but they should certainly be uh, factored into the strategy as uh, the, the, the focus of what we're talking about here. Uh, it, it's almost a, a compounding factor uh, for for schools in rural areas and small schools. Okay, just briefly add to that. <clears throat> um, th there absolutely are distinctive 
features and even diverse features across rural parts of Scotland. I mean, one is just kind of organising activity, transport, broadband, and so on. Um, um, but we can learn from other parts of the world that have similar challenges. Um, and I would also, I think, make the point that rural, predominantly rural local authorities are really spread out in terms of how they're, how they're faring on some of these indicators. Um, and they're all, some of them are, are um, their, their trajectory, their, their changes recently over time look quite different as well. It, so for some rural authorities, but, but definitely not all, there's probably a challenge about, in their schools, quite small numbers, maybe, of, of children living in pockets of deprivation or very, very dispersed groups of families who are um, uh, getting by on a low income. And so b when you lack that visibility or that scale, uh, it makes it all the more important you understand your data and all the more important that whatever measures you're using um, are non-stigmatising. So there are different kinds of risks and opportunities that come in rural, rural areas. It probably does uh, uh, mean that we need coming through the regional improvement collaboratives a particular focus on rural experiences and lessons learned um, so that we've got um, you know, appropriate comparisons and clusters going on uh, and not trying to make you know, inappropriate lessons taken from cities that just don't work in the you know, Gallery of the Borders, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, Ross, you've got one final question, I believe. Yes, just uh, very briefly. Thanks, Convener. Much of the discussion that we've had this morning is uh, focused on schools and how we um, improve the outcomes for uh, children and parental engagement, for example, in school. But we're all very well aware of the evidence that uh, the difference to a child of uh, their experience in early years um, is massive. And I'm wondering how, when, for example, uh, the, the focus, PEF money has been uh, towards schools. When we talk about parental engagement, it's very much how do you engage in child's learning at school. How do we use early years uh, to actually mitigate the, the effects of poverty on a child's life? How, how do we improve outcomes at that preschool level? If we look at the policy environment at the moment, you would say that that is recognised and reflected in Scottish government policy. And, and that a lot of the uh, <coughs> the infrastructure is, has been focused on that, so that the, that has been recognised. It's there. Again, I think it comes back to locally. How is it operationalised? What what is the is the the skills base in early years? Are they uh, aware of the evidence of what works? And building it into a continuum. And what you know, we talk about progression from early years to primary and so on into senior and beyond. I think seeing that you know, three to eighteen curriculum and beyond as a, a, re a reality, and looking at how how does that get reflected in the system, I think we need to look at that because certainly the policy speak and the policy documentation is there. The guidance is 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 there to do that to to address a lot of what you're talking about. But the reality is trying to get it uniform across Scotland and, and uh, made, made real, I would argue. In that case, can I thank the witnesses for their attendance today? That was a very useful open session in this inquiry. And it brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting and we'll now move into private session. I shall spend for a moment or two to allow the witnesses to leave before continuing. Thank you again.